Citizenship Amendment Act 2019, a controversial act enacted by the parliament, which is right now sub judice pending in the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court has to look into the validity of this particular law. In the previous class, we have discussed the background as to how this Citizenship Amendment Act was enacted by the parliament. We also understood as to what is Assam Accord, the NRC process carried out by the government of India and then also in the background of illegal migrants from pa Pakistan who are staying in various parts of the country, especially in the border states and also on the backdrop of the NRC which was carried out by the government, what necessitated the government to come out and enact this particular legislation. Citizenship Act 2019 provides for citizenship to certain categories of people, that is, the persecuted minorities belonging to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh. And these persecuted minorities belong to six categories of people or people belonging to six religions who are respectively minorities in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh, who, even if they have entered into India as an illegal migrant, but before 31st December 2014, now, all these illegal migrants are entitled to become a citizen of India by virtue of the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019. Critics say it is a highly discriminatory law which discriminates and grants citizenship on the grounds of religion and discriminatory on the grounds of religion. It goes against the secular values and the credentials of our constitution. It is violative of the principle of equality before law. Now, despite such criticism, it has to be <coughs> settled and decided by the Supreme Court of India. Now, this is what we have been seeing in the last class. Now, we will go to the last section of the citizenship uh, chapter and we will try to understand as to what are the grounds by which the citizenship may be lost. Now, please understand the constitution made it very clear the concept of citizenship is not a permanent concept. If you go to Article 10 of the Constitution, Article 10 of the Constitution gives very clearly that whoever is deemed to be the citizen at the commencement or somebody who has acquired the citizenship subsequent to the commencement of the Constitution shall only be varied, the status of citizenship shall only be varied in accordance with the law that is made by the Parliament. That means the Parliament has a power to determine the citizenship of an individual, not only to determine the citizenship of an individual. Once the citizenship is conferred, whatever may be the mean, whatever may be the means, that citizenship can also be taken back by the state, but provided the parliament enacts such a legislation. Now, the Citizenship Amendment, Citizenship Act 1955, not only provides the grounds on which the citizenship can be acquired, which was seen in the previous classes, it also provides grounds as to how the citizenship may be lost. Three grounds are mentioned in the Citizenship Act 1955 as to how the citizenship can be taken away or how the citizenship can be lost. It can be through the process of renunciation, it can be through the process of termination, and it can be through the process of deprivation. So, we will try to understand as to what these grounds are. I am Babu Gunashegaran, Faculty Indian Polity and Governance, Study IQ English. I have cleared the civil service examination in the year 2016 and secured All India rank 337. And then subsequently, I have been teaching, and even before that, I have been teaching the subject Indian polity and governance and specialized over a period of time in this particular subject. And I have also been helping students preparing for the civil service examination. So, it has been reiterated a number of times. The objective is to help the students. In making this particular video, that is series on uh, M. Lakshmi Kant, that is Indian polity, is to help the students preparing for the civil service examination and who are planning to make their attempt in the year 2024 and then in the subsequent years. So, with this, we will just get into the topic where we are left in the last class. So, we will try to understand as to how the citizenship can be lost under the Citizenship Act 1955. Three grounds as to how the citizenship can be lost. One is the renunciation of citizenship and then there is a termination of citizenship and then finally, there is also something which is called as a deprivation of citizenship. These are the exact terms that is mentioned in the Citizenship Act 1955. 
once we are done with this we'll go to some practice questions we'll try to solve certain practice questions that will strengthen your conceptual understanding with regard to citizenship not only with regard to citizenship i have put certain practice questions from union and its territories part 1 from preamble and also some of the salient features of the constitution so we'll try to revise all the things that you have seen in the previous classes loss of citizenship by renunciation now what do you mean by renunciation so one thing that you should basically understand and remember in your mind renunciation means it is voluntary in nature when i say it is voluntary in nature that the individual concern the citizen concern in this particular case nobody is forcing that individual it is voluntary upon the individual to come and say that he wanted to give up the citizenship of india and what could be the possible reason we are not sure what could be the possible reason maybe he has taken the citizenship of some other country and so he has already given an undertaking to that particular country that he will renounce the citizenship of india so he is fulfilling that undertaking that he has given to a foreign country which right now where he is going to be a citizen or maybe that he is not a citizen of some other country but he doesn't like india probably he doesn't like the policies in our country he doesn't like the leadership in our country or some or the other reason so the reason is not very important when somebody renounces the citizenship of india but what is very important is that it is voluntary on the part of the individual and voluntarily he makes an application to the government authorities in this case would be ministry of home affairs that he is going to renounce his indian citizenship he no longer needs the citizenship of india and that is basically what is called as renunciation so in fact if the parents renounce their citizenship the law says it will automatically apply to a minor child if they have a minor child it applies automatically but however the minor child on becoming an adult that means when the minor child reaches 18 years of age the minor child has an option of taking back the citizenship of india if the minor child which turned to be an adult or who turned to be an adult if they give it in writing to the government authorities that he or she want to take back the indian citizenship within a period of one year after becoming an adult so this is what the law says so what is the primary thing that you have to understand with regard to renunciation so renunciation is something which is voluntary in character and there is no need to specify a particular reason per se or there is no particular reason per se under which this may happen it is for the individual to voluntarily renounce their citizenship and if the parents renounce it will automatically apply to a minor child under what circumstances an application for renunciation may not be accepted or it may be put on hold by the government of india is when the government of india is at war with some other country rather than government of india when india is at war with some other country during the time of the war if somebody gives an application for renunciation of the citizenship during that time the government has the power to put such application on hold because maybe that the citizen is afraid of the war and he wanted to renounce the citizenship so it will be put on hold temporarily and then subsequently the decision will be taken by the government so this is basically what is called as renunciation <coughs> come to next thing that is citizenship by or the next factor is the termination of citizenship now what is termination of citizenship in all the cases be it renunciation termination or deprivation the citizenship is lost but termination happens under a specific uh, condition unlike renunciation where there is no specific condition where an individual voluntary does that whereas in termination it is not voluntary the application of law comes into effect under what circumstances the application of law comes into effect that suppose let us assume an indian citizen acquires a citizenship of a foreign country let us assume an indian citizen acquires a citizenship of usa now the constitution of india and the laws in india says that the indian citizens will not be able to have dual citizenship but however despite that he acquires a citizenship of a foreign state under such a circumstances the indian authorities the individual should have renounced the citizenship on his part but if that indian citizen who has acquired the citizenship of a foreign state in this case united states of america if he fails to renounce the citizenship by his own then the law will come into force and the indian authorities will terminate his citizenship so this is basically what is called as termination so when does termination happens termination happens when a citizen of india acquires a citizenship of a foreign state and he has not yet renounced his indian citizenship under such a circumstances the law will apply and his citizenship will be terminated so in this case also please understand 
that there is an exception that if an Indian citizen acquires a citizenship of a foreign state during war, then till the time the war is over, his citizenship may not be terminated. So, after the war, the citizenship will be terminated. And in this case, if an Indian citizen acquires a citizenship of a foreign state, the termination of his citizenship will not apply to a minor child unless and until the minor child also acquires the citizenship of a foreign state. So, this is what you will have to understand with regard to termination. So, please understand what is the difference between renunciation and termination, whereas renunciation is voluntary, termination is not voluntary. Renunciation is on the act of an individual, whereas termination is the application of law, when the individual failed to renounce the citizenship. And for renunciation, there is no specific ground for uh, termination, the specific ground is that the individual has acquired the citizenship of a foreign state. And then the last category is that deprivation. Now, please understand in case of both renunciation and termination, whenever the citizenship of an individual is lost, so for all reason he becomes a foreigner. The moment we are not an Indian citizen, then we are foreigner for the state India. And can we again get the citizenship of India? Of course, yes, we can again get the citizenship of India, but as to how a foreigner would get. So, it will fall under the category of registration or naturalization. So, you already seen as to how one can become the Indian citizen through the process of registration and naturalization and accordingly they can become the citizen of India. Now, the next thing is the loss of citizenship by deprivation, the third category. So, in this case, it is a compulsory termination of Indian citizenship on certain grounds. It is similar to that of termination, but in termination, we have seen that the ground on which the citizenship is terminated is because an Indian citizen has acquired the citizenship of some foreign state. But whereas in case of deprivation, there is also termination of citizenship, but not on the ground that he has acquired a citizenship of a foreign state. It is not that he has acquired a citizenship of a foreign state, but he has done certain other things as it is provided in the law, wherein his citizenship can be deprived. So, what are the grounds which is given under the Citizenship Act 1955? as to how the citizenship of India can be deprived. So, these are the grounds. If any of these grounds are satisfied, then the citizenship of India can be deprived and the individual can be deprived of his citizenship. So, if the government authorities come to know that the individual has obtained the citizenship by fraud, suppose let us assume an individual has obtained the citizenship, whatever be the grounds on which he has acquired the citizenship, but he has acquired the citizenship fraudulently. Let us assume somebody acquiring the Indian citizenship by naturalization. One of the condition for naturalization is that he should stay in India for a period of 12 years. He should be conversant and he should be having a good knowledge of any language specified in the 12th schedule. Sorry, 8th schedule. So, and the other categories that you have seen. So, we have to satisfy all these conditions and he is submitting proofs for all these things. Later, the government after conferring the citizenship comes to know that there is a fraudulent information or he has given a fraudulent proof which is not a valid or uh, which is not a proper document and then the government thinks that he has acquired the citizenship by fraud in the first place, then his citizenship can be deprived. Two, he has become disloyal to the constitution. I have already said when somebody becomes an Indian citizenship, they have to take an oath of allegiance that they will be loyal to the constitution of India. Say, for example, there are fundamental duties and there are certain things, values in the constitution that everybody has to respect. And if they have become disloyal to the constitution, that is also a ground on which their citizenship can be terminated or that is deprived. Unlawfully communicated with the enemy during the war. So, this is also a ground on which their citizenship can be deprived. Or once they become a citizen of India, within five years after naturalization, that means the law is saying how they become the Indian citizen, they become the Indian citizen through the process of naturalization. Within five years after the citizenship is conferred, if the citizen is imprisoned in any country for two years, so first of all, he become an Indian citizen through naturalization. And after conferment of citizenship, not five years have lapsed, not five years have happened or over. And in the meantime, already he is con convicted in for any offense in any country for that matter. And if it is two years, then also his citizenship may be deprived or someone who is a citizen of India, he is ordinarily resident outside India for a period of seven years continuously. Then also his citizenship shall be deprived. So, these are all the grounds on which the citizenship can be terminated. 
and on these grounds if the citizenship is terminated then it is called as deprivation of citizenship but termination in general means that the citizenship of an individual is terminated because he has taken up the citizenship of some other country so in case of renunciation in case of termination in both the cases if somebody's citizenship is lost they can again become the indian citizen through the process of the registration and naturalization because for all purpose they are foreigners in case of deprivation, if any individual loses a citizenship, can we again become an Indian citizen? The law says that is also possible. Selectively, the government has the power to again give the citizenship back to that particular individual. So, that means the government has a discretion upon who can become an Indian citizen again, even if their citizenship is deprived. So, these are the things that you have understood with regard to the citizenship. So, these are the things that we should know about the citizenship. Now, looking into the point of examination, not many questions have come from this particular area, but you cannot skip this area. At any time, UPSC can ask the examination. UPSC is also unpredictable public service commission. So, the moment uh, over a period of time students feel lethargic about a particular area, that is exactly where UPSC will ask the questions. So, it is better to be prepared in all the areas. And not just for the sake of examination, but otherwise also as a citizen of India, you should be aware of the provisions with regard to citizenship in our country. And most importantly, the provisions of the Citizenship Act 1955. So, we have covered everything. So, initially we started seeing as to who are those categories of people who would be the citizen of India at the commencement of the constitution. And then subsequently we have understood the provisions under the Citizenship Act 1955. We have seen citizenship by birth citizenship by descent, citizenship by registration, citizenship by naturalization, we have seen citizenship by incorporation of territory, special provisions for those categories of people covered under the Assam Accord. And in the process, we also understood the Citizenship Act 1955, the background and the circumstances under which the government enacted this particular law and also the criticism that is surrounding the Citizenship Act 1955. And then we have also seen under the law, there are three ways by which the citizenship can be lost. One is renunciation, then that is termination, third is deprivation. So, now we will get into the last part of this particular chapter. There is nothing more to learn from this particular chapter per se, but now we will try to solve few questions that will help you to have a better clarity on the various concepts that you have learned in this particular class with regard to this particular topic. Look into the first question Which of the following articles? or which of the following article gives the power to the parliament to make laws to regulate the matters relating to citizenship in India. So, it is very, very important you remember at least this particular article, the most important article in the part 2 of the constitution. I said part 2 of the constitution deals with from article 5 to article 11, article 5 to article 11 and it is article 11 which gives the power to the parliament to make the laws. So, what is the right answer in this particular case? It is Article 11. It is based on the power that is given to the Parliament under Article 11 of the Constitution. The Parliament has enacted what is called as the Citizenship Act 1955. Okay, so the right question is Article 11. So, come to question number <coughs> again, question number one. Which of the following article gives the power to the Parliaments? So, Article 8 is related to a person of Indian origin, a PIO who can become the Indian citizen at the commencement of the Constitution. You have seen that. Article 9 is saying that there cannot be possibility of dual citizenship. So, dual citizenship is not possible. So, that is the crux of this particular article. What is Article 10 of the Constitution is saying? Article 10 of the Constitution is saying somebody who becomes a citizen of India, the position of the citizenship cannot be altered unless and until a law is made by the parliament. But the power to make such a law under the Constitution is given under Article 11 of the Constitution. So, the right answer is option D. Come to the next question. Consider the following statements. Only a person of Indian origin can acquire the Indian citizenship by registration. So, this is not true because I said that there are certain categories of foreigners who can become an Indian citizen through the process of registration. Although a person of Indian origin is one category of people, but then the statement is saying only a person of Indian origin. That is not possible. Because in addition to the person of Indian origin, we have also seen a foreigner who marries an Indian citizen can become an Indian citizen if he stays in India for a period of seven years. And in addition to that, we have seen that OCI card holders can also become an Indian citizens, not just the person of Indian origins. So, 
but OCI is also someone who is a person of Indian origin who gets this OCI card holder status. So, here the word only makes this particular statement wrong. Okay, so this particular statement is wrong. Statement 2. Citizenship by naturalization is also open to illegal migrants from all the countries who came to India. Now, citizenship by naturalization, we have seen that under the Citizenship Act 1955. Although the original act, that is the act that was passed by the parliament in 1955, that does not provide for any citizenship to an illegal migrant. But the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019, that is what we have seen, the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 allows illegal migrants to become an Indian citizen. But these illegal migrants has to be from Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh and from six religious communities. Only from six religious communities which are considered to be minority communities in Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh. So, this particular statement is also an absolute statement. Citizenship by naturalization is also open to illegal migrants from all countries. So, it is not from all countries, it is only from Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh. So, this particular statement is also wrong. The constitution provides details of who can acquire citizenship after the commencement of the constitution. The constitution provides details as to who can be automatically the citizen of India at the commencement of the constitution under Article 5, 6, 7 and 8. The constitution does not give any information as to who can become the Indian citizen, who can acquire the citizen after the commencement. Rather, it has given only the power to the parliament to do that. Okay, So, this particular statement is also wrong. So, which of the statements given above is are correct or rather not which. So, this is what I wanted to stress. How many of the above statement is are correct? In fact, this is what the change that was brought in by UPSC in this particular year. Instead of asking which of the above statement is are correct, where you will pick statement 1, statement 2 and statement 3, here the question is how many of the above statement, it does not matter what is the number of the statement, but how many of the above statement is are correct? How many of the above statement is are correct? So, the right answer is option, so rather it is option D, A, B, C, D. So, it is none of the statements are correct. Option D is the right answer. Come to the next question. Consider the following statements. Statement 1, the citizen shall exercise all the civil and political rights in our country. This is true. In the very first class of citizenship, I said that uh, the citizen shall have all the civil and political rights in our country. They have civil rights with regard to right to freedom of speech and expression, right to freedom of movement, right to trade, occupation, business and also the political rights, the right to contest election, the right to vote in the elections. So, all these rights are available. Statement 2, aliens shall not exercise any right in our country. That statement is not right. Although the aliens may not exercise all the rights in our country, but they also exercise certain rights. Say, for example, right to equality is for both aliens as well as citizens. Right to freedom of religion is for both citizens and aliens. The aliens in our country may exercise certain property rights. So, the aliens does exercise some of the rights, but not the rights as exercised by the citizens. Okay. So, aliens shall not exercise any right in our country. So, that is not the right, answer, right statement. The aliens does exercise some of the rights. If they say aliens exercise all the rights as that of a citizen, then it becomes a wrong statement. Which of the statements given above is are incorrect? So, incorrect means statement 1 is right. So, the right answer is option B. 2 only is the right answer. Come to the next statement. Sorry, next question. Which of the following rights are available to aliens in India? So, alien means who is a foreigner, who is not a citizen. Right to vote? No, the aliens cannot exercise the right to vote. Remember this. Only citizens can exercise the right to vote. Right to contest election? This is also not possible. Only a citizen can contest election in our country. Right to public employment, that is also not possible. Right to public employment in general is not there. But there are few exceptions for the subjects of Bhutan, subjects of Nepal. Some exception is there, but that is not a general rule. For certain examination, the subjects of Nepal, Bhutan can appear in our country because we have a friendly relation with these countries, but that too not for all the government jobs. So, as a general principle, this is wrong. Choose the correct answer from the quotes given below. So, here also the correct answer is option D, that is none is the right answer. So, all these things will give you a conceptual clarity, whatever we have learned. So, try to solve these questions also once you are done with the lectures. Which of the following categories of people were eligible to become Indian citizen at the commencement of the constitution? 
that means on 26 January 1950, the question is asking who are eligible to become the Indian citizens. So, this we already discussed that article 5, 6, 7 and 8 deals with who are eligible to become the Indian citizen at the commencement of the constitution. So, see statement 1, person domiciled in India. So, this is exactly what is given under article 5. Article 5 talks about persons who are domiciled in India. So, when you say that the persons domiciled in India, so they are eligible to become the Indian citizen under article 5. A person of Indian origin living outside India, so this is exactly what is given under article 8 of the constitution. So, they can also become Indian citizen. Person returned from Pakistan to India. So, this is what is given under article 6 of the constitution. Persons who have returned from Pakistan to India, but with subject to certain conditions, but this provision is there. And then a statement for persons migrated to Pakistan from India, but later returned to India. So, this is exactly what is given under article 7 of the constitution. So, choose the correct answer from the quotes given below. So, the right answer would be all of the above, that is option D is the right answer in this case as well. Question number 6. Which of the following is true presently for someone to acquire the citizen of India by birth? That means uh, under the Citizenship Act 1955, uh, there is a condition which is called as acquisition of citizenship by virtue of birth. The question is asking that uh, who is eligible to become the Indian citizen by virtue of birth? So, one of the primary condition for anyone to become an Indian citizen by virtue of birth is that they should born in the territory of India. And then subsequent to that, today born in the territory of India and then both of the parents should be an Indian citizen or at least one of the parents should be an Indian citizen and other is not an illegal migrant. So, that is the condition today. So, the question is asking presently. Presently means on date when you are reading this particular question. Born in the territory of India and at least one of the parent is an Indian citizen. This is not true because it is not talking about the status of the other parent. Statement 2 born in the territory of India and both the parents are Indian citizens. So, this is also not true because it is not necessary that born in India and both the parents are Indian citizens. Born in the territory of India and at least one of the parent is an Indian citizen and other is not an illegal migrant. So, this is what is a requirement. Now, this may also be true born in the territory of India and both the parents are Indian citizens. But the most appropriate thing is not necessary but both the parents are Indian citizens both can be Indian citizen or at least the minimum condition what is required. We should always go for a minimum condition that is required. So, born in the territory of India, at least one of the parent is an Indian citizen and other is not an illegal migrant. So, the most appropriate would be option C. Come to the next question, which one of the, which of the following or the means to acquire the citizenship of India under the Citizenship Act 1955? So, there are six ways by which citizenship can be acquired. Citizenship by birth, citizenship by descent, citizenship by registration, naturalization and also citizenship by incorporation of territory and the provisions related to the Assam Accord. So, here birth is there, descent is there, registration is there, naturalization is there. So, the right answer is option D that is all of the above. Come to question number 8. What are the ways by which citizenship can be lost under the Citizenship Act? So, I said that there are three ways by which the citizenship can be lost. Renunciation which is voluntary, there is no specific reason and then citizenship by termination. So, termination means that is on the ground that an Indian citizen has acquired the citizenship of some other country. Deprivation is also basically termination but on certain grounds which is given in the act itself. But all the three things are given in the act. So, choose the correct answer from the quotes given below the right answer is option D. So, all the three ways by which the citizenship can be lost. Question number 9, the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019, the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 provides illegal migrants to become Indian citizens or to become citizens of India from which of the following countries. So, what is the provision of this particular act? On careful reading of this particular act, we understood that the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 provides for illegal migrants from three countries. What are the countries? Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh belonging to six uh, religious communities to become an Indian citizen because these six religious communities are considered to be persecuted minorities in our country. 
So people belonging to these three countries, belonging to six uh, religious community, can be considered to be what is called as persecuted minorities, and they are eligible to become Indian citizen. How many of the above statements is are correct? So the right answer is option C. All the three things are the correct one. So three only. The Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 is applicable. Is not applicable. Is not applicable means. Where does this law does not apply? Will this law apply to the entire country? And we have clearly seen when we are discussing about the Citizenship Act 2019 that the Citizenship Act 2019 have few exceptions as to where it will not be applied. We have seen that it will not apply in Schedule 6 areas and also it will not apply in the inner line permit system. So, Schedule 6 areas are tribal areas or the tribal districts. In the states of Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, and Mizoram. So, though to those to, to these tribal districts, the law is not going to apply. And also, it does not apply in the inner line permit areas. When you talk of inner line permit areas, what does uh, this inner line permit areas means? These inner line permit areas are those areas where we, even as a citizen of India, should take a special permit, a quasi visa system. So, today some of the states like Mizoram, Nahaland, Arunachal Pradesh and recently Manipur has also become part of this inner line permit system. That does not mean the entire state, certain regions, certain parts of these states are protected under the inner line permit system. So, the law does not actually apply in the six schedule areas and also the areas covered under the inner line permit system. So, fifth schedule is wrong and union territories is also wrong. So, choose the correct answer using the codes given below. So, what is the right answer? So, it should be option B that is 2 and 3 only that is the right answer. All right, we'll move to the next question. Question number eleven. The Citizenship Act 2019 is not applicable to which of the following cases or which of the following areas? So probably I think the same question has been repeated. So we'll just skip this particular question. Go to the next question. That is question number twelve. Which of the following majority is required to in the Parliament to make laws under Article Three of the Constitution? So, to answer this particular question, first of all, we will have to understand as to what is this Article 3. If you go back to your Union and its Territories chapter, what is this Article 3? Article 3 is giving the power to the Parliament to make internal reorganization within the country, to alter the boundaries of the state, to increase the area of a state, to decrease the area of a state, to change the name of the state, to merge two states, to convert a Union territory into a state, a state into a Union territory. Any form of internal reorganization in the country can be done by the parliament by virtue of Article 3. And we already seen any law that will be made by the parliament under Article 3, it is to be done by a simple act of parliament. It requires only a simple majority. And by the simple majority itself, it can make changes in the Schedule 1 and Schedule 4 of the Constitution. So, what is the majority that is required in this case? It is a simple majority. And only if the act has to amend the other provisions of the constitution outside schedule 1 and schedule 4 then it requires a special majority otherwise it can be done by a simple majority or a simple act of parliament question number 13 the preamble to the constitution of india is an so what is the right thing about this the preamble to the constitution of india is an integral part of the constitution yes it is an integral part of the constitution not an integral part of the constitution the Supreme Court in the Keshav Ananda Bharati case has categorically said that the preamble is an integral part of the constitution. Statement 3, not an integral part of the constitution, but helps in interpretation of the constitution. This is also wrong. In fact, uh, the Supreme Court said it is an integral part of the constitution, but what is the purpose does it serve? It helps in interpreting the provisions of the constitution. So, the most appropriate thing in this particular case would be, which of the above is our correct statement? So, the correct statement is only option D, that is one only. The other statements are not right. In fact, the Supreme Court in the Birubar Union case 1960 for the first time said that the preamble is not an integral part of the constitution, which has been subsequently modified and altered by the Supreme Court in the Kesha Bharati case 1973. Come to question number 14, consider the following statement. Statement 1. The preamble to the constitution can be amended. So, can the preamble be amended? So, this was also answered by the Supreme Court in the Keshavananda Bharati case. It said that yes, the parliament has the power to amend the preamble. 
similar to that of the other provisions of the constitution the parliament has a power to amend the preamble as well under article 368 by using its amending power but what the what the parliament cannot do is that they cannot amend the basic features in the constitution which they have innovated in the the Keshavananda Bharti case in the form of doctrine of basic structure. So, what is the limitation upon the parliament today with regard to amending the preamble? So, in general, they can amend the preamble, but what they cannot amend is the basic features in the preamble cannot be amended. Like the words like sovereign, uh, secular, uh, democratic, republics, all these words are considered to be part of the basic structure which cannot be amended. So, with this, come to the question the preamble to the constitution can be amended? Yes, of course, it can be amended. The preamble was first to be drafted by the constituent assembly. In fact, the preamble was the last to be drafted in the constituent assembly. After all the provisions of the constitution was drafted, the preamble was drafted in the end, a motion was introduced, then the preamble was adopted and it was last to be added to the constitution of India. The very purpose as to why it was added in the end is, is so that it uh, summarizes the entire philosophy of the constitution. So, which of the statements given above is are incorrect? So, the incorrect thing would be option B. Two only is incorrect. Come to next question. The elections to the Lok Sabha and the Legislative Assembly elections is based on the principle of today the Lok Sabha elections, today we are a democracy, and one of the important features of democracy is that there should be regular elections and there should be periodic elections. It should be a free and fair election. And then it should also have an universal adult suffrage. That means every adult individual should have the right to vote. So, with that uh, information only, you can eliminate these things. If you say that it is an limited adult suffrage, this is not right. And then here also, so you can directly eliminate the limited adult suffrage. And uh, then you should know as to what is the principle based on which the election is happening. It is based on proportional representation or first pass the post system. The election to the Lok Sabha and the election to the legislative assemblies is based on the principle of first pass the post system. That means there is no need for any minimum quota of votes to secure the or uh, to declare to be the winning candidate of the election. All that the winning candidate has to do is he has to secure more votes than the other candidates. So, it is also based on the principle that the winner takes all. So, whether the winner takes less number of votes or more number of votes, he has to get more number of votes than the other candidates. So, you can eliminate all the proportional representation. So, you're just left with only one option that is universal adult suffrage and first pass the post system. So, presently, how many states and union territories are in India as on 1st June 2023? So, to avoid your confusion, I have put a date also that as on 1st June 2023, how many states and union territories are there in India. So, today we have 28 states and 8 union territories. So, please keep this in your mind. It may change in the future because the parliament can go for a reorganization under Article 3 of the constitution. But today, if you see how many states, we have 28 states and 8 union territories. The last state which become an union territory is the state of Jammu and Kashmir. On August 2019, this was made by the parliament, but by passing the uh, by Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act, so, subsequent to that, we have only 28 states and 8 union territories. Try to remember this. Do not make a mistake. Question number 17. The bill introduced in the parliament regarding the reorganization of states require the prior consent of what? So, this is again related to article 3 of the constitution. A bill which is introduced in the house of the parliament, it requires prior consent of whom? That means only with their consent it can be introduced in the house of the parliament. So, we have already discussed this, any bill which will be introduced in the parliament, it requires a prior recommendation of whom? It requires a prior recommendation of the president of India. It is not the union home minister, it is not the prime minister, it is not the chief minister of the concerned state, it is a president. But then the president before giving the recommendation, he has to refer the bill to the concerned state legislature. But then the opinion of the state legislature is not binding upon the president. So, you have seen all these things under Article 3 of the Constitution and the procedure to make a law. So, with this, if you see the answers uh, to this particular question, that is question number 17. So, the right answer is option C. C is the right answer for question number 17. <coughs> Come to the next question. Which of the following is or the feature of the Indian Constitution? 
which of the following is or the feature of the Indian constitution. So, we already learned the various features of Indian constitution. So, which of the following is or the feature of Indian constitution. So, if you see the features of Indian constitution, statement 1, it says that it is a written constitution. Uh, so, written constitution is one of the feature of Indian constitution because the constitution is codified into a single document. This is true. The Indian constitution is a federal constitution. Is there any division of power between the uh, union government and the regional governments that is the state governments yes of course there is a division of power the, the constitution itself provides for decentralization or the division of powers the constitution gives as to what shall be the power of union government what shall be the power of the state government so they cannot encroach upon their powers so, this demarcation is clearly given in the constitution not necessarily there is an equal power but whatever is a power has been demarcated so, of course, yes, the constitution of India is federal in nature. And then, it, does it provide for separation of powers? Does it delineate the power between the three organs of the state? That is the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. So, that is also there. So, the separation of power is also there. Although there is no clear separation of powers, but by principle, the constitution provides for separation of powers. When I say that there is no clear separation of powers, there is some element of overlap between the legislature and the executive. But by principle, if you see, the constitution provides for the separation of powers and then it provides for independent judiciary of course yes independent judiciary which is outside the control of the other two organs of the state so that they can uh, ensure justice in a free and fair manner unitary form of government is not a feature of indian constitution because we are a federal constitution so unitary is uh, completely against the concept of the federal provisions which is not part of the indian constitution but although yes the constitution of India under certain circumstances can become unitary in nature, which we will understand subsequently during the uh, emergency times and when there is a president rule in a particular state or national emergency, the federal provision to some extent becomes unitary in character, but otherwise uh, that is not the case. So, the right answer is federal in nature. So, choose the correct answers from the codes given below. So, if you see the correct answers from the codes given below. 5 is not the right answer. So, the right answer would be option 1, 2, 3 and 4 only. So, option C is the right answer. Come to next question that is uh, question number 19. Constitutionalism means, what does it mean by constitutionalism? So, constitutionalism means that uh, to put it in a very simple way that whatever the principles that is laid down in the constitution that is followed effectively, correctively or not. And if you look into the Indian constitution or most of the democratic constitution across the world, one of the major features as to why they wanted to have a constitution is to limit the powers of the state. So, when you say this constitutionalism, it is very clear that it is a limitation upon the powers of the government. So, any constitution functions within the limitations which is set by the constitution, then you can see that there is constitutionalism in that particular country. So, statement A, unlimited powers for the parliament amend the constitution, wrong. Supremacy of the judiciary does not give supremacy to anyone. Wherever there is constitutionalism, the constitution is supreme, not any of the other organs. And then none of the above is not the right answer because the right answer is option C. So, we will go to the last question for today's discussion. Which of the following are the important provisions of the Indian constitution? So, fundamental right, is it an important provision? Yes, of course, part 3 of the constitution deals with fundamental rights. Fundamental duties, part 4 of the constitution, yes, it is an important provision. Directive principles of state policy, part 4 of the constitution. So, all these things are important features of the Indian constitution. Choose the correct answers from the codes given below. The right answer is option D. So, with this, we are done with the citizenship part and also the part 2 of the constitution. So, what we have discussed in part 2 of the constitution. We have started with understanding the concept of citizenship and we also understood as to what is the difference between a citizen as well as an alien and in an alien we understood as to who is a friendly alien and an enemy alien. We understood the scope of rights that can be exercised by the citizens and the aliens. Then we have understood as to who would be deemed to be the citizen at the commencement of the constitution that is on 26 January 1950. And then what is the reason why the constitution does not elaborately provide the provisions as to who can acquire the citizenship subsequent to the commencement of the constitution, rather it has given the power to the parliament. And then we have understood based on this particular power, the parliament has enacted the Citizenship Act 1955. 
And then in the Citizenship Act 1955, what are the grounds on which the citizenship can be acquired, which includes citizenship by birth, descent, registration, naturalization, incorporation of territory and special provisions as to Assam Accord. And in the process, we also understood as to what is Assam Accord and also what is the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019. We have understood the provisions of Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 and the criticism surrounding the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019. Then we have understood as to what are the ways by which the citizenship can be lost. That is, the citizenship can be lost by way of renunciation, termination and deprivation. And in the process, we also understood as to who is a person of Indian origin and who is an overseas citizenship of India, what is OCI cardholder status and what are the privileges that an OCI cardholder might have in India. So, these are all the areas from where the prelims question may be asked and if at all they can ask your mains question because the matter is subjudice also. So, probably when you give the examination, maybe some judgment is delivered. So, probably the Citizenship Amendment Act may be relevant for your mains examination, but otherwise the other areas are relevant for your preliminary examination. To get the PDF of uh, this particular uh, presentation, if you want, you can download that from my telegram channel, Babu Gunashekaran 337. And uh, to get further updates also, you can get those updates related to Indian uh, polity and also in general related to the preparation of the civil service examination, you can get those updates from my telegram channel. So, for maximum benefit, try to watch all the videos. So, with this, we are done with the citizenship part. In the next class, we will start the part 3 of the constitution that is the fundamental rights. The most important part when it comes to the Indian polity, understanding of the fundamental rights, what are the various rights guaranteed, the issues arising out of these, some of the case laws. So, we will try to understand all those things in the coming classes. And it is a very big topic, it is going to take some time for us to understand the fundamental rights. But keep watching. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me in my Telegram channel also, in my in my uh, Instagram account, which is also Babu Gunashekaran337. Thank you very much. All the very best. God bless.